Hey everyone. So I just got an email from one of my patrons asking how to deal with writer's block. And it's such an important question. It's such a big question. It's so multifaceted. There are so many different issues that might be causing any given individual and in any artistic or even non-artistic medium to have a kind of writer's block, a stultification of inspiration, so to speak. And I've talked about it and thought about it um, a lot over the years, and I've had this conversation with so many different people and got lots of different insights. And so I decided to make a video um, about it and just kind of give you my own subjective uh, opinions about what has most specifically worked well for me to try and uh, mitigate writer's block in my own compositional process. Um, so here are just kind of a series of, of various things to think about and just little pieces of advice that I've learned over the years about how to how to ameliorate writer's block. So the first thing that I would say is that it's absolutely imperative to not divest the compositional process from other aspects of your life, right? Um, different parts of your life are separated to some extent, but they're also connected. It's sort of like how in the compositional process, you can think about harmony by itself, you can think about melody by itself, you can think about rhythm by itself. To some extent, it's useful to focus on those individual subjects, but ultimately when you go and compose a piece of music, they inform each other, right? And the great composers, you know, Stravinsky, Korsakov, Ravel, they are thinking about all of these musical perimeters simultaneously and they all interconnect and inform one another. It's sort of the same thing with your compositional life, right? You shouldn't necessarily just uh, sit down to compose a piece of music, sort of intercomposing mode, and expect inspiration and quality music to come out, right? Whether or not you're particularly happy in your life, whether or not the non-musical aspects of your life are giving you meaning, whether or not you're in a good mood, whether or not you eat um, well and healthily, all of these things can impact your state of mind, and your state of mind has a direct impact on your compositional process and whether or not you feel inspired or energized and even the kind of thing that you compose. I think we often have this misconception that we sort of have this stable identity over time as a composer and not only do you mature as a composer and what you write and how you solve your compositional problems one day be different from the next day or a month or a year in advance, but if you even just go and write a piece of music on an empty stomach as opposed to writing music on a uh, a full stomach or, you know, with four hours of sleep as opposed to seven hours of sleep, this can make a tremendous difference on, on what music um, you write and the quality of music you write and the quality of your thought processes. So the basic non-musical things to consider, and we'll get into, you know, more specifically musical techniques to, to mitigate against writer's block, but I would say before trying out any of those other things, make sure that you're getting seven to nine hours of sleep, right? Sleep is absolutely essential, right? There is a great podcast done between Matthew Walker and Joe Rogan. Matthew Walker is a sleep expert and he wrote a book, which is, I can't remember the, the title of the book, but I'll put it in the um, description. And he, there are so many little things um, like, you know, whether or not you're looking at blue light before going to bed, um, and, uh, whether or not you're using, uh, uh, like if you drink a little bit of alcohol before going to bed, that's sedation as opposed to being sleep. And so you're not actually getting REM sleep. You can go check out all that stuff from him, but implementing all of those things as I have done over the past six months has made a tremendous difference. I feel so much more energized and it has made the quality of my music, um, undoubtedly um, better and my ability to solve compositional problems uh, better. Another thing that I notice about sleep, not to get into sleep too detail because it is a non-musical thing, is that I find that I'm more creative. And I, there's this interesting thing that happened where if you listen to a piece of music that you love over and over again, repeatedly in close proximity of time intervals, there's a risk that you're going to become emotionally desensitized to it, right? We've all experienced this phenomenon where, like there was, a, Owl City is a great example, right? Hello Seattle and Fireflies are both good examples of this. When those songs first came out, I loved them. I thought they were great songs. Um, they made me tremendously happy to listen to them and I just liked them compositionally. I liked the melodies. But it got to the point where they played on the radio over and over and over again, and you heard them when you went out to eat at places, and they 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 sort of lost their luster, right? Because they were played um, so frequently, 
And the fascinating thing that I've discovered is that kind of emotional desensitization in some senses reset when you have a good night's sleep. I found that there'd be pieces of music, um, which when I listened to like as a child, for example, that really affected me deeply emotionally and sometimes brought me to tears. And as I became an adult, that emotional reaction sort of became replaced and I knew what to expect. But interestingly enough, and of course this reaction might not be as dramatic for others, but for me personally, I found that when I got a very, very good night's sleep, good quality as well as quantity, that my emotional sensitivity to music, my proclivity to feel deep meaning out of music, my proclivity to cry listening to, like just the other day I was listening to Barbara's Agnes Day, which of course is um, an arrangement of Adagio for strings, which was an arrangement for, uh, of the slow movement of his string quartet, and that's a beautiful, sad piece of music, but it's very overplayed, right? And that's a piece that you, you sort of listen to nowadays and you're like, yeah, this is a beautiful piece, but it doesn't necessarily bring you to tears. Um, uh, one day after I got a particularly good night's sleep, I sort of woke up um, uh, and I listened to that and it just brought me to tears and I was bawling my eyes out and I was like, I was like, whoa, like JJ, like you've never, had, like when's the last time you had this reaction to a piece of music? And of course, correlation does not equal causation. Maybe there were other factors in my life, but then I kind of experimented and sort of paid attention to the nights that I got good sleep as opposed to the nights that I got a little bit poor sleep, you know, due to the time constraints of college. And I found that consistently, the more sleep that I got, the more emotionally sensitive that I was. So it's not just a left brain thing. I think it's also a right brain thing. Anyways, enough about sleep. Diet is also imperative, right? Eating healthy is imperative. Drinking plenty of water is imperative and getting plenty of cardio, right? Getting cardiovascular exercise, even if it's just 30 minutes of speed walking, right? You don't have to become a a, a, a runner, you don't have to go get super buff at the gym, but just 30 minutes of intense cardiovascular workout can significantly improve your cognitive capacity and is one of the best ways to prevent your IQ from, it has been substantively proven, cardiovascular activity at least 30 minutes a day is the best way to mitigate against your uh, IQ lowering as you get older, which it normally does. Anyway, so those are some basic non-musical things that as a prerequisite, you should have you should have those in place, right? To ensure that you're, you, you are in the best possible, most pristine state of mind to go about composing a piece of music. Okay, now that that's all, now that, that that's set aside, let's talk specifically music, okay? So the first thing to consider is this. When you look, well, what kind of writer's block are you experiencing? Because there are different kinds of writer's blocks. There are writer's blocks of conception, and there are writer's blocks of solution. And what I mean by that is, initially, when you go to conceive a piece of music, especially if you don't have any particular inspiration, if you don't have a film to start with, or a video game to start with, or even if you do have those things, but they just aren't particularly inspiring to you, if you don't have an initial seed or impetus or impulse with which to grow a tree out of, so to speak, then it's very difficult to just pull a rabbit out of the hat, right? You know, to just come up with musical ideas out of nowhere. And what I would say, or, or rather that maybe you can come up with musical ideas, but you don't particularly like them, um, or they just sound like something someone else has written, or they just sound like something that you've written and you feel like you're repeating yourself. Oh, wait, well, there are a lot of individual issues here. The first thing that I would say is that whenever you go to compose a piece of music, you must think about the time that leads up to that. First off, compose during a time to the extent that this is possible, considering that I know many of you have full-time jobs or are college students, and I know that sometimes scheduling can be erratic and it's difficult to kind of get it to do what you want to do, but to the extent that it's possible that you can do this, try and schedule compositional time during the time of the day, having to do with circadian rhythm and, and other constituents of your your life where you are most energetic uh, creatively, right? And it's fascinating because the different people have different temperaments and different personality proclivities. And so some people are morning people and they just like, yeah, I've got the energy during the morning, but after like four or five, six o'clock, uh, lights go out and I just kind of like lose all energy. I'm the complete opposite. I have my most creative impulse at like after 10 p.m., right? I just, it just sort of builds up during the day. I'll listen to music. Uh, um, I'll talk with friends and become inspired. I'll sort of study. I'll be thinking about compositional things. I'll look at art. I'll read poetry. And then by the time that 10 p.m. comes along, I just have to write music. People are different, right? Everyone's different. Um, another thing that may be contributing to your writer's block is an improperly or rather ill-conceived compositional process from the get-go. 
People oftentimes think of the entire compositional process as one single sort of flowing thing where you're in the same mindset the entire time. To me, there are very distinct aspects of the compositional process, and some are more to generalize the neuroscience, left hemispheric and some are right hemispheric, right? Some require more lateral thinking and some require more discrete specific thinking. Like counterpoint, for example, to me is something that really requires specific discrete thinking, whereas harmony requires lateral thinking. In order to come up with an emotionally satisfying and fresh harmonic choice, I need to be able to play things and then react to them in a sensitive way, which is more of a right brain thing than a left brain thing. And obviously there's a lot of overlap, right? Music composition, it need, needless to say, is one of those um, arts that really does incorporate the specific discrete kind of logical thinking in addition to the emotional lateral creative thinking. But anyway, I digress. The point that I'm trying to make is that when you go and compose a piece of music, and initially if you don't have any ideas, what you need to go, at least in my personal opinion, is into brainstorming mode. Okay, So brainstorming mode, you need to turn off the self-critic. Right? The self-critic is an extremely useful um, internal rhetorical device, and you shouldn't throw away the self-critic in, entirely because there are definitely aspects of the compositional process, and we'll talk about this in a second, where the self-critic in, in, in is invaluable and where you need to sort of figure out how to, to get the self-critic to work for you as a, like, like a really good editor, right, as opposed to sort of letting the self-critic drive the, every aspect of the process, right? So it is important, but for the get, beginning of the process, for me, you just kind of kind of splat things out, right? Just try this, try that, try this thing, try that thing. And, and often what I like to do is just get a big sort of, it could be a DAW for those of you that love working with a digital audio workstation format. You can improvise in the, uh, on your given instrument of choice. I often find myself starting with improvisation. Or you can open up a big sort of blank piece of sheet music with lots of different instruments and just experiment, just toy around with melodic figurations, right? Just sort of arbitrarily, right? Um, try try with particular intervallic combinations, try out different motifs, and don't erase anything. And even if you write, even if you immediately think something is uh, a poor idea or it's kind of cliche, don't worry about it. Write it down, right? And there, I need to take a little bit of, um, of a detour to talk about how your self-critic interprets what, in, interprets what is cliche and also what whether or not you can trust your self-critic uh, at a given moment in your life and in your day, right? So the first point, um, the former of those points, is that whenever you cast a particular judgment about a particular musical idea, you want to make sure to not conflate every parameter of music and also excuse a tiny bit of material outside of its context of where it might be placed in a piece and only look at it in sort of what I like to call vacuum sealed laboratory conditions. And what I mean by that is this. You can look at a motive, right? A little motive, dum ba -da dum ba -dum, and you can be like, ah, that's cliche, right? That's it. It's cheesy, right? But there are so many different ways to harmonize that motive. There are so many different ways to... Uh, dress it up timbrally and texturally. There are so many different rhythms that you could slightly shift that motive rhythmically. You can place it in different meters. And um, sometimes something which seems cheesy or cliche or, or dull in isolation may or may not actually sound like a... a, a be a relief from something that comes before in the composition and maybe a sort of refreshment, right? So the first thing that I would say is that, again, save the self-critic for later once you get a bunch of stuff out on the page and it's very specific and you can judge whether or not an idea works contextually. But when you're just starting in the brainstorming process and you're just trying to figure out whether or not a little motive is good or bad, don't even do that, right? Because you can't know, right? Just because you don't like the way that it sounds right here in your particular mood, playing back with a piano sound with how your brain is sort of filling in the harmony subconsciously, Make sure you're aware of all that stuff that's going on, right? And so don't necessarily always trust your subjective sense of whether or not something is good or bad objectively, right? Whether or not it can be good or bad, well, it's not so much a matter of good or bad, and it's not a matter of subjectivism versus objectivism and, you know, everything is relative. In some sense, what I mean is that whether or not, I would argue, an idea is good or bad cannot be considered with the idea in isolation, but it be considered with the idea in context, right? Given the fact that you have this conception of what you want your piece to be, and given the fact that this, this particular idea is implemented within the context of a larger musical framework, then you can look at it and say, ah, okay, given that this is what I want to achieve with this music, and this is what I want to feel when I listen to it, and given that this came before and this is going to come after, now I know that maybe this is the right idea or maybe it isn't the right idea, okay? But you can't just look at the idea in the brainstorming process and determine whether or not it's appropriate. Save it, right? So this brings up a, a second point.
have a notebook, and you've heard this before, but like seriously, like actually implement this, implement this in your life. Have an audio recording device. Everyone has. I use voice memos on my phone. Um, and or if you're a sheet music oriented person, have a little um uh, notebook with sheet music. And anytime you have a particular melodic idea or rhythmic idea or even just a conceptual idea, you know, it sometimes it might be just like literally if you're kind of really nerdy about it, a conceptual idea. Like for me, just the other idea. Just the other day, I was like, you know, uh, oh, what if I created a kind of bitonality that used both whole tone scales? And I was like, whoa, like maybe that's a really stupid idea and it'll sound like crap. Maybe it's a great idea. And then I sort of messed around with it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool sound. And I probably might use it in a future piece of music, right? That's something that just occurred to me and I just wrote it down. So it could be something conceptual and abstract or it could be a specific motive or rhythm or bit of orchestration, you know, an idea for a kind of texture. It could be literally anything, but just as you're going throughout the day, let your brain just sort of freely float and think about these things and write them down as they come to you. And then when you go and compose a piece of music, it's not that you're starting with a blank page, but you have this giant library of original ideas. And I, I literally have files on my computer, Sibelius files, of like thousands of melodies organized according to their aesthetic and character. And oftentimes, like a good example of this would be my Sylvan Odyssey, which is one of my most popular pieces on SoundCloud. One of the melodies from it, a kind of Dorian tune. I just, that was just a melody that just sort of kind of popped into my head, you know, three or four years before I wrote the piece. And then when I went to write the piece, it was actually, I actually had to write that piece pretty quickly to, to reach a deadline. I was like, dang it, I don't really have any inspiration. Let me look through my tunes, my tune bag. And I looked through my tune bag and I found that and I was like, oh, you know, and I probably thought nothing of it when I first, and I might, that might have been something that I would have just thrown away, but it's a good thing that I didn't, right? And so anytime you come up with an idea that isn't right for a piece of music, don't throw it away. Save it. Put it somewhere else. You may be able to use it in the future. There's another famous example where Eric Whitaker talks about his piece Equus, which he originally composed for wind ensemble and then later reorchestrated for the London Symphony Orchestra in his album Water Night. There's a behind-the-scenes video that you can find on YouTube where one of the most memorable ideas, a little clarinet solo at the beginning, a very nice little motive, he was about to throw it away. He was going through ideas at his piano in his studio, and one of his colleagues walked over and said, you know, that's really nice. And Whitaker was like, I'm going to throw that away. And he's like, don't you throw it. If you're going to throw it away, you give it to me and I'll use it. And so Whitaker's like, well, I, I guess I will use it. And then he ended up using it and it's one of his most popular pieces, right? So again, don't necessarily trust your self-critic, especially in the, in the beginning brainstorming part of the process, to uh, don't trust it um, uh, without reserve to let you know whether or not you can get something valuable out of any given... Uh, um, fragment of musical material. Okay, so that's that's another point to make. All right, now uh, let's talk a little bit about the self-critic, though. Okay, because we talked about the first kind of writer's block, which is where you sort of have a blank page, you haven't even started the piece yet, and you just don't know what to do. Right. Um, so we kind of just talked about some ways to mitigate that. Right. Make sure your mental health is 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 uh, good. Make sure you write at a specific time of day that works well for your for your uh, cognitive capacity and make sure that you make the brainstorming process as free and unfettered by the self-critic as possible. Okay. But assuming that all that's in place, let's say you're writing a piece of music and you know, you've written like four and a half minutes and you're pretty, you know, satisfied, but you just, you don't know what to do next. All right. Um, there's a, there's a perfect um, story that I like to tell, and uh, you, some of you may or may not have heard this story before, but I'm going to go ahead and reiterate it because it's relevant here, about Beethoven, right? So Leonard Bernstein, in one of his omnibus lectures, went through Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and he made a very profound point that stuck with me ever since I listened to this. He said that musicologists went through Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the first movement, well, I'm assuming they went through all movements, but specifically referring to the first movement, and they looked at his discarded sketches, and they could sort of see chronologically, because he would mark the date, um, whether or not he, how many iterations it took for him to achieve the sort of final product of a symphony that we all know and love and is extremely famous today. And they were, uh, Bernstein was specifically looking at the ending, right? And we know that the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony First Movement has a very succinct, short, um, satisfying ending, and we can't imagine it being any other ending than it is. It's one of the most perfect codas ever composed, right? Um, 
And Bernstein looked at it and uh, saw that the, the first ending that Beethoven composed, um, he wasn't satisfied with. He scratched it out, right? And, and then he made it a little bit longer, right? Presumably to be a bit more satisfying, you know, uh, because longer means more satisfying, right? And so he still wasn't satisfied with it. And so finally, in the third iteration, he made it even longer. It's like, it has to be longer. It has to be satisfying. So he made it even longer. It still wasn't working for him, right? Finally, right, presumably after a good night's sleep, who knows, um, Beethoven ended up, he sort of had an epiphany, a moment of epiphany, and said, you know what, maybe actually it needs to be even shorter than the first ending, right? And so then he made the ending even shorter than the first one he composed, ah, and that was the right one. That was the one that ended up being in the symphony, okay? So your intuition, the sort of right part of your brain, your emotionally sensitive, aesthetically oriented, sensitive, uh, aesthetically oriented part of your brain, can, is very good at sort of um, uh, giving you the red light that there's an issue, right? You can listen to something and immediately know whether or not you don't like it, but then don't conflate that with your left brain theorizing a particular hypothesis about whether or not a certain reason might be that you don't like it specifically, right? Because you can trust your right brain that you don't like it, right? Like there's something you don't like about it. You can trust your aesthetic sensibility, generally speaking, right? And different composers have different aesthetic sensibilities, but to the extent that you want to be true to your own aesthetic sensibilities, you can trust that. But then when your left brain comes along and says, ah, maybe it's because it's not long enough. Maybe it's, ah, it's that chord. Maybe it's not, nah, it's the rhythm. No, nah, it's ah, the melody, you know. Those are interesting hypotheses, and one of them might be the case, but don't overly attach yourself to one of them, right? So, again, so to, to sort of fill in this analogy into Beethoven, right? You know, Beethoven's right brain said, I don't like this ending, right? I don't like it, right? Uh, but then his left brain said, well, you know, it's because it's not satisfying enough, therefore, ergo, it's not long enough because long equals satisfying, right? And that was sort of a false equation that led him along, you know, all these ways to not make a light bulb before he finally sort of reconceived the intellectual notion of what the issue was. Actually, maybe it's 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 too long and, and it needs to be shorter. And then that was what ended up making uh, uh, making the cut, right, for the correct musical decision, right? Um, and again, I know I'm kind of superimposing objectivity. There is certainly an element of subjectivity and what, what, you know, you like or dislike one day might change to some extent. Um, to the other day, it's, it's a heuristic, which is useful in most cases. But in any case, the only point that I'm trying to make at is that your self-critic is very useful, but you have to be very careful to cultivate it, right? And one of the things that I've learned to do, and I'm still working on, um, but I've learned to do over the years that has been extremely helpful is when I listen to a, a piece that I'm writing, and when I'm listening to like four bars or eight bars, there are two things that I can do to really help me know whether or not I like or dislike it, and, and what if there's a problem, how to fix that problem, right? So the first thing is for me to really, really try and psychoanalyze my emotional reaction and try and figure out what actually is it that I dislike about this, right? And then to listen very carefully. Because if you listen broadly, you can sort of listen to a four-bar section. I don't like the four bars, right? But then you think about it and you listen to the four bars. And you're like, you know what? Actually, of this four-bar section, I like this bar. I like that bar. It's really that bar that I don't like. So then you sort of magnify a glass in. What do I not like about that bar? Do I like the rhythm? Well, yeah, I like the rhythm. Do I like the harmony? Well, yeah, I kind of like the I kind of like the harmony. Do I like the texture? Well, you know, actually, it's kind of thin texturally, right? And so then you have a hypothesis, and then you try and fix it, right? And um, so then maybe you thicken the texture a little bit. And then when you thicken the texture, you're like, actually, you know what? I, thickening the texture um, didn't fix the issue, but it made me realize that actually what the issue was is this instrument up here playing this particular thing, and maybe that needs to be down here, right? And so anyway, so, you know, you can sort of like psychoanalyze yourself to try and narrow in on what you think might be the issue that you're having, and then once you come up with a hypothesis, then test it, try and implement a particular solution, and if that doesn't work, well, the very fact that it doesn't work further reveals where you should be pointing your magnifying glass, because you shouldn't be pointing it there, and eventually you'll come to a solution and you'll solve the writer's by. Another issue that I found is that I often will look at a small section of it, because I'm a very kind of, a, I tend to be temperamentally, naturally a very, when it comes to music, detail-oriented person. I'm all about getting the counterpoint right and all these little details and that little thing there and just the right texture right. Um, often, often at the risk of losing sight of the big picture, the forest for the trees, so to speak, right? Or the trees for the forest, rather. But you don't want to lose the forest for the trees. And I am also a very impatient, as you can see, uh, efficiency-driven individual, and so I just, one of the things that I started doing 
I think about four years ago that really tremendously improved my compositional process was forcing myself to listen to, if I'm working on a particularly for, a particular four bar segment, to listen to it in the context of the piece, right? Because if you're working on the four bars, you can hear everything, right? Because you just messed with the third of the chord and you made it this, right? You just changed the voicing, you just did this, you moved and you made that little neighbor tone. And so if you're just working on this four little, little four bar segment, you know everything that's going on because you were just working on it, right? But if you just sort of, you know, go back and start back over at the beginning of the piece or section and then listen to it, right? By the time that that section comes in, you don't have all the baggage of knowing intellectually because now you're listening to it in the context. And then you know, ah, you know what? That's right. And sometimes you, we, we, we get committed, right? If you spend too much time focusing on four and eight bars, getting them just right and fixing it and just sort of tinkering with it and then you sort of play it and then it's, oh, yes, great, great four bars. And then you go back and listen to it in context and then you're like, oh, yeah, it's a great four bars, but you know what? It just doesn't fit after this it's not right for this piece of music then you have to take the take the hit and just delete it right or put it in another file you know like like i said um and then sort of reconceive it so if you overly commit yourself to any given musical idea the sort of ego part of you and also the fact that you put so much work into it um, but remember the work isn't for not when you delete something it isn't that you are throwing it away because you learn something about what is right by inverse inference right um, what is actually going to be the correct decision for a given piece of music, okay? Um, so those are just some of my general thoughts about writer's block, right? Um, another final uh, point that I would like to make that is another thing that Leonard Bernstein brought up. So Leonard Bernstein, uh, as you all know, was an avid educator and a composer, um, political activist, and, uh, of course, a composer, right? And he often found that some of these things were at odds with each other and some of these things were symbiotic, but one thing that was at odds is that he found himself, like he compared himself to Mahler, because Mahler was also a composer-conductor and had that sort of dialectic dynamic. He, Bernstein, thought that being a conductor and also composer was different, difficult because as a conductor, he was so thoroughly ensconced in all the music that he was conducting, and it was so, so, um, he was so inundated and overflowed with all of these notes of other composers that when he went to write his own music, he found it very difficult to be original, right? And so there's a, there's a kind of palate cleanser, um, uh, there's a kind of palate cleanser uh, ritual that you can go through where, you know, maybe one day just don't listen to any music, right? If you're having a writer's block in the sense that the writer's block isn't that you can't write anything, but everything you write sounds like something someone else wrote, so a really an originality block, right? Um, then what you can do is just, you know, t if you can, and if you're a music student, I know this is impossible to some extent, but to the extent that you can, take a day or a two or a week and just don't listen to any music, right? Just just listen to the sounds of the birds, listen to the wind, right? Just sort of empty your mind in a sort of meditative state, right? And then when you go back and listen to music, it's going to be so, you know, just like a meal tastes delicious after fasting, right? Um, it's it's can sort of like a musical palate cleanser, right? That that sometimes that that works wonders if that is your issue. Sometimes that you know it, that uh, uh, doesn't work, but it it it, it, uh, it can't hurt, right? It's always a good exercise to try. And oftentimes I find that that's just what I need as a palate cleanser of not listening to any music for one or two days. Then when I go and compose something, my brain is sort of fresh, and of course all the music you've listened to. And your subconscious is going to come out and affect you, but that's fine, right? What you're trying to get is all the conscious music that you've listened to in, the, in your short-term memory that you've heard in the past few days and, and things and sort of the things that are stuck in your head. You want to get all that cleansed so that the sort of very organic and natural things from deep in your subconscious can sort of combine together at, at, at a more molecular level so that what comes out in the surface structure sounds like you. Deep down, you can tell that there's some Mahler, there's some Mozart, there's some Ravel, right? But it isn't as if you sort of merely copied something on the surface structure because it will, it's what was stuck in your head. Um, yeah, so I hope that was helpful. Um, uh, if I think of any other points, I'll, I'll bring them up in the comment section. But I'm really interested to hear what you all think. How do you all feel as if you solve writer's block? Do you feel as if you do solve writer's block? Is there a, is there a particular kind of writer's block that you're having that I didn't address? Um, uh, feel free to have a conversation. I'd love to keep this going um, in the comments. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. Um, I will be making more videos soon because I'm graduating from college and then I will finally have my free time. So I'm really, really excited to get back to making more YouTube videos. And I also am probably going to make more short little videos like this, sort of answering a question on a specific topic, you know, kind of a frequently asked questions thing. Um, anyways, and as always, I apologize for the foreign uh, language. Um, well, I apologize for those who, who, who speak English as a second language language and so my talking is very quick um uh you can always slow the youtube video down um uh and if you have difficulty understanding even 
with that, anything that I said, just put the time code and ask me about it in a comment, and I'd be happy to clarify what I was talking about. Anyway, thanks as always for your subscriptions, for your support. By the way, I went to Knoxville recently, and uh, Logan Campbell, an excellent conductor who is a graduate of Furman University, um, and the uh, wind ensemble that was comprised of various excellent players from local um, college orchestras, they performed my piece Epinephrine. It's a wonderful performance. I was tremendously excited, and there's going to be an audio recording and a video, which I'm going to post on YouTube as soon as I have that, so stay tuned for that. And I'm also working on the finale of my symphony, which I'm tremendously excited. I think it's my best work yet, and I'm really, really excited to show it to y'all. Um, so anyway, so look forward to those and I will see you all later.